this video, we're going to be talking. We're going to be taking a look case of the story of the disappearance. Hello and welcome. I'm Chris. Mary Flora Bell is an English girl who murdered two preschool age boys in Scottswood, an inner suburb of Newcastle upon Tyne, in 1968 the first of which when she was just 10 years old. In both instances, Mary informed her victims they had a sore throat, which she would massage before proceeding to strangle them. Bell's mother, Elizabeth Bell, was a well-known local prostitute. Elizabeth was absent from the family home, leaving her children in the care of their violent alcoholic father, Billy Bell. We'll just say he's a violent dude. He was arrested for armed robbery, domestic violence, and all kinds of other stuff. Billy married Elizabeth when Mary Bell was young, so it's unclear whether he's her biological puppy. Mary was an unwanted and neglected child, according to her aunt, Issa McCricket. Minutes after Mary's birth, her mother was heard shouting, Take that thing away from me, when nurses tried to place her newborn baby on her chest. As a baby, and as a young girl, Mary frequently suffered injuries from household accidents while alone with her mother, which led her family to believe her mother was trying to harm or even kill her daughter. On one occasion in the 60s, Elizabeth Bell dropped her daughter from an apartment window, and in another, she tried to overdose her with sleeping pills. She also once sold Mary to a mentally unstable woman, and her older sister Catherine had to travel across Newcastle to get Mary back. Despite her negligence and abuse, Elizabeth's family offered to take Mary in, but Elizabeth refused. You see, at this time, she was a practicing dominatrix, and supposedly offered her young daughter to her client. Both at school and at home, Mary exhibited numerous signs of disturbed and unpredictable behavior, sudden mood swings, and chronic bedwetting. She frequently fought with other children and supposedly attempted to strangle or suffocate her classmates on several occasions. On one occasion, she actually made another girl eat sand in an attempt to, I guess, kill her? Obviously, it didn't work. This violent behavior made many children reluctant to socialize with her, so she frequently spent her free time with Norma Joyce Bell. No relation. She's a 13-year-old girl that lived next door. On Saturday, May 11th, a 3-year-old boy was discovered wandering dazed and bleeding on St. Margaret's Road in Scottswood. The child informed police he was playing with Mary and Norma on the top of an air raid bunker, when one of the girls pushed him 7 feet to the ground. The same evening, the parents of three small girls contacted police to complain that both Mary and Norma had attempted to strangle their children as they played in a sand pit. That evening, the girls were interviewed about these incidences. They denied ever playing around the bunker, claiming that they were the ones that found the boy, bleeding heavily from a head wound after he had fallen. Further questioned about the attempted strangulation of the three young girls, Mary denied any knowledge of the incident, however Norma admitted Mary had tried to throttle each of the girls. Stating, Mary went to one of the girls and said, What happens if I choke someone? Do they die? When Mary put both hands around the girl's throat and squeezed, the girl started to go purple. I told Mary to stop, but she wouldn't. Then she put her hands around Pauline's throat, and she started going purple as well. Another girl, Susan Cornish, came up, and Mary did the same thing to her. Police gave both girls a simple warning. No further action was taken. May 25th. 1968, the day before her 11th birthday, Mary Bell strangled four-year-old Martin Brown in the upstairs bedroom of an abandoned house on St. Margaret's Road. Supposedly, she committed this crime alone. Brown's body was discovered by three kids around 3 p.m. on the same day. He was laying on his back with his arms stretched above his head. Aside from the specks of blood and foam around his mouth, no signs of violence were visible to his body. A man named John Hall soon arrived and attempted CPR. Both Mary and Norma were standing in the doorway watching the man, attempting to save the boy's life. The next day, an autopsy was performed on the body of Martin Brown. The coroner was unable to determine the child's cause of death. Although he was able to discount the investigator's theory that the child had died from poisoning through the ingestion of tablets, on Mary's 11th birthday, May 26th, she and Norma broke into a nursery in nearby Woodland Crest. They gained entry by peeling tiles off the roof. Once inside, they proceeded to vandalize the place. The following day, staff discovered the break-in and vandalism and immediately notified the police, who also discovered four separate notes which claimed responsibility for Martin Brown's murder. One of these notes said, I murdered so that I may come back. 
Another read, we did murder Martin Brown. F off, you yes. A third note simply read, F off, we murder her. Watch out, Fanny and F the final note was the most complex. The police dismissed the incident as a tasteless and childish prank. Two days later, on May 29th, shortly after the funeral of Martin Brown, both girls went to his mother, asking to see her son. When June Brown replied that they couldn't see her son because he was dead, Mary replied, Oh, I know he's dead. I want to see him in his coffin. On the afternoon of July 31st, 1968, three-year-old Brian Howe was last seen outside his home playing with one of his siblings, and also, you guessed it, Mary and Norma Bell. When he didn't return home that afternoon, relatives and neighbors started searching. That night, the search party discovered Brian's body. The first officer on the scene said that a deliberate but feeble attempt was made to hide the body. His lips were blue and several bruises and scratches were found on his neck. A pair of broken scissors lay close to his feet. The coroner concluded Brian died from strangulation, and that he had died up to eight hours before they found his body. The killer had evidently squeezed Brian's nostrils closed with one hand, and he or she had gripped his throat with another. Numerous puncture wounds were inflicted to his legs before death. Sections of hair had been cut from his head, and his had been partially mutilated, and a crude attempt had been made to carve an M into his stomach. The relatively small amount of force used to murder the child led the coroner to conclude the murderer had to have been a child. Numerous gray and maroon fibers were discovered on Brian's clothes and shoes. Investigators found that the fibers had to have been transferred to the child by his murderer. The discovery of Brian Howe's body sparked a full-scale manhunt. Over 100 detectives across North Cumberland were assigned to the investigation, and more than 1,200 children were questioned. Two of the children questioned by detectives on August 1st were Mary and Norma Bell, whom witnesses had already informed investigators had been seen playing with Brian shortly before he died. In her initial interview, Norma seemed excitable, whereas Mary was more observant and standoffish. Although both girls were evasive and contradictory in their initial statements, they freely admitted to having played with Brian on the date of his death, but denied to having seen him after lunchtime. Investigators questioned them further the following day. Mary stated she remembered seeing an eight-year-old boy playing with Brian that afternoon, and that she had also seen the boy hitting Brian. Furthermore, she stated she also remembered that the boy had been covered in grass and weeds as if he had been rolling in a field, and that he had a small pair of scissors. She saw him trying to cut a cat's tail off with the scissors. Only the police knew about the scissors found at the crime scene. In addition, the local boy she named was promptly questioned, and they found that that afternoon he was at the airport with family and numerous witnesses were able to corroborate their claims. On August 5, 1968, Norma was questioned by the police. She made a full statement in which she admitted being present when Mary had actually strangled Brian. According to Norma, when the trio were alone, Mary seemed to go all funny, pushing the child into the grass and attempting to strangle him before stating to her, my hands are getting thick, take over. Norma said she then ran from the scene, leaving Mary alone with Brian. A forensic examination of the clothing owned by both girls revealed that the gray fibers discovered on Brian's body were a match to a wool dress owned by Mary, and the maroon fibers found on the victim's shoes were a match to a skirt owned by Norma, and the same gray fibers were found on Martin's body, too. Brian Howe was buried in a local cemetery on August 7, 1968, in a ceremony attended by over 200 people. Both girls were formally charged with the murder of Brian Howe at 8 p.m. that evening. Mary prepared a written statement in which she admitted to being present when Brian Howe was murdered, but insisting that Norma did it. She also admitted they broke into the nursery the day after Martin Brown's murder, vandalizing the property, then writing the four notes. After the arrest, both girls were psychologically evaluated. The results of these tests revealed that Norma was developmentally delayed, a submissive character who displayed emotions and was easily manipulated. Her, all of her charges were dropped apparently. They don't really say a lot about that. Whereas Mary was a bright yet cunning character, prone to sudden mood swings. Occasionally, Mary was willing to talk, although she rapidly became defensive in nature. The four psychiatrists who examined Mary concluded that she was a complete and total psychopath. 
After Mary was released from a 12-year sentence, she was granted a new identity for her own protection. This granting of new identities was actually popularized by this case in the UK and is even called the Mary Bell Order. She is now 64 and her daughter is 37. She lived a relatively normal life. We generally get a decent number of views on this channel, but almost none of you are subscribed. Please subscribe and leave a like, it would really help this channel grow. Also, leaving a like on this video could help raise awareness to this case and many others.